This is how the Ottoman Empire looked like in 1683. And this right here is Vienna. If the Ottomans want to continue their expansion westward, they need to take the city. Vienna is a sort of door to Western Europe, and they knew that. That's why there are 150,000 Ottoman Turks besieging the city, and this situation has been like this for two months. The 15,000 soldiers and people of Vienna, outnumbered 1 to 10, have been fighting hard, holding, but eventually everything comes to an end. Food ran out, people were starving inside the city, disease was killing hundreds of people. They had so many corpses, they couldn't bury them. And the Ottomans were close, really close. They have finally finished digging the tunnel, they had the charges set under the walls, uh, it was just a matter of time. And the Viennese knew that, and they were prepared to fight to the very last one inside the city. And when all hope was lost, The winged hussars arrived. Hobieski, their king, led the charge of the 3,000 winged hussars plus the 15,000 cavaliers of the Holy League down the hill, smashing into the Ottoman Turks and destroying them completely. This is known as the largest cavalry charge in human history. This is the most important and the most popular battle of the Hussars because of all the stakes behind it. It is seen as a turning point in history for both the Europeans and the Ottomans. But for the Hussars, they fought some crazier battles. 1400 versus 12,000, 5000 versus 30,000, 1000 versus 10,000, and so many others. There are two things in common between all these battles. One, the Hussars were always outnumbered, from 1 to 6, 1 to 8, to even 1 to 10. And two, they won every single one of them. So, how did they do it? How can a small number of guys on horses win against these impossible odds? What's so special about them? Their equipment, their training, their tactics, or even their wings? How did they become one of the best cavaliers in human history? That's what we are gonna try to answer. Let's just go quickly about their origins, how they came to be, because as you will see, it is part of their strength. And when I say Hussars, I am talking about the ones with the wings, the Polish Hussars. You know, the cool and badass ones, because you can find several other Hussars. In fact, a Hussar is just a member of class of light cavalry in Central Europe at certain times. So, where do they come from? Poland? You know, they have Polish in their names. Yes, but I'm talking before that. The oldest reference of Hussars in Polish records dates to the year 1500. And to put it simply, they were exiled soldiers from the Balkans, mainly from Serbia and Hungary, working as mercenaries in Poland, until this guy became king of Poland. He reorganized the Hussars of his royal guard from light cavalry to heavy cavalry. They dropped some pieces of their old equipment, then picked up new ones, and the true winged hussars were born. And this change also affected the way they were recruited. This is the interesting part. As we just saw at the beginning, they were mercenaries. But after the reform, the hussars became mainly nobles. So this is how they did it. This is a typical company. First, the king would send a letter called the letter of recruitment to the commanders. To become a commander, you need to be a noble and you need to be rich. You need to own at least several villages. Then this commander would contact companions. And these guys were nobles as well. And each of these companions at their turn would recruit two retainers. Then the commander will select one from the companions to be lieutenant and the lieutenant will also select a temporary lieutenant. 
in this company this is the real company from 1658 we have the commander with 25 horses lieutenant and six horses temporary lieutenant with four horses then they are followed by 48 companions each with three horses the companion himself plus the two retainers plus three servants one for each fighting man and you have a company of 178 horses then you add up these companies you put a general at their head and you have your army this method of recruitment is not unique or new it was used by many other countries or empires but the hussars have one other thing they had to pay for everything themselves. They had to pay for their equipment, their horses, and even servants they bring to the battlefield. Technically, they were paid, but in reality, this pay arrives months or even years later, and sometimes never. And even without pay and all the expenses, there's the danger of simply dying. And despite all that, they still fought, so why did they fight what did they fight for to put it simply they fought for their homeland for glory and for social advancement the first two are pretty obvious some of the hussars fought to defend their homeland and others to kill as many enemies and make a name for themselves on the battlefield and then there are the ones who became hussars to start their political career they would serve three to five years and when they come back they would have the title of soldier or knight which helped a lot in politics and there is another category of hussars the ones who wants to become nobles it was pretty it's pretty easy to become noble if you fought as a hussar. If you fight alongside other nobles, they would recommend you or let you marry their sisters or daughters and you become noble. Every hussar has some kind of an intention when he fights, that's why most of them fight for real. And that's also why all of them pay for their equipment, it is seen as a sort of an investment. Speaking of the equipment. As always, when it comes to the Hussars, on one hand they use some basic and effective pieces for their time, and on the other hand they use some unique and flashy pieces of equipment. For example, the lance, the most important weapon of a Hussar. It is long, very long, between 3.8 to 5.6 meters long. It has this special ball-shaped handguard and it is hollowed. It is empty inside from the tip to the handguard to make it lighter. Because the lighter the better, the lighter the taller and the taller the better. It was especially made to counter and outreach pikemen. The lens comes with this thing attached to the horse. The hussars would aim and lock their lens in place using it so it would withstand the shock of the impact during the charge. And even if the hussars dies during the charge, the lens stays in place and the charge would still be a success. But the lens this tall and light has a weakness. It breaks easily and it broke almost every single time. So the hussar had three other weapons to rely on after the lens breaks. First weapon is the Polish Sabre, the most important weapon after the lens. It comes with the fully crossed hilt to protect the knuckles and the thumb ring on the guard to speed recovery between blows. It was especially made for horseback fighting. And yeah, don't forget some gold and jewels to make it look cooler. Then there is a second sword, 130 to 160 centimeter long blade with triangular or square cross section. Some people say say that they used it in battle and some say it is just a ceremonial weapon because it is only useful when you are chasing someone and it is really hard to carry around. And the third weapon is a pistol. They had one or two wheel lock pistols, a simple yet effective weapon. The same goes for the armor. It was a simple breastplate articulated half lobster like with these bands or lamps at the bottom, plus a helmet and two iron sleeves. It was made of steel and it was burnished rather than blackened, so it would shine also for the style. For the horses, they had oriental breeds with Arab blood, 
little bit slower but stronger. The horse was the most expensive and the biggest investment of a hussar. And last but not least are the wings. The thing is, nobody agrees about anything when it comes to these wings. Was it attached to the back or the saddle? Was it two pairs of wings or single one? The most common answer is that it is just a piece of wood with eagle feathers and it is attached to the back of the armor. And for their use, you will find a bunch of theories. They say it was for back protection or to scare the enemy's horses with the noise and so many any other theories but you will not find the convincing one the only thing that seems true is that they just wore them to look cool and to scare the enemies at the same time yeah that's it it is all about the badass looks There are two important skills the Hussar has to master, horse riding and handling the lance, and doing these two things at the same time, one hand for the lance and one hand for the horse. Both of these skills are learned from a young age, there are fathers that put their sons on horses at two years old, then they spend the remaining years training until they become a Hussar. And as for the battlefield, they had pretty simple tactics, but first to understand their tactics we need to understand their objective and their objective is simple break the enemy's formation that's all they had to do and to do that they use this simple formation most of their battles go like this at the beginning the formation was to advance at the gentle trot until about halfway to the enemy then the final order comes lower your lenses the lens was lowered alongside the horse's head and the unit charged at full speed until contact with the enemies and you repeat in most cases one or two of those charges will do the work most of their battles are one like this. Nothing too complicated or too fancy, simple and effective. Nothing stays the same, everything comes to an end, and the same goes for the Hussars. By the end of the 17th century, the Hussars were too expensive. An expensive horse, an expensive lens that could be used only once and too much servants and stuff and on the other side one enemy soldier with simple gun can kill such an expensive hussar in fact the battle of vienna is considered the last successful battle of the hussars Hope you liked the video, if you enjoyed watching, don't hesitate to sub and leave a like, it helps a lot and yeah, I will see you soon.